Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Caitlin from Oxford University Press. Um, I'm here to introduce our conversation partners today. Uh, first, we have Dr. Charlie Bamforth. Uh, he's the author of In Praise of Beer, which is a helpful guide to just about everything there is to know about beer, um, from brewing it to enjoying it with food. He even shares uh, the, what pairs best with a meal of insects. Uh, yeah, he basically covers it all. <laughs> uh, joining him today is the Sierra Nevada Brewing Company ambassador, Terrence Sullivan. Uh, he's actually at the brewery right now, as you can see. <laughs> uh, so these two will chat for a little bit uh, and then answer some audience questions. If you are watching and you want to ask a question, uh, you can go ahead and pop those in at any time. If you're on Crowdcast, you can put those in the uh, chat box. And if you're on Facebook, you can just put those right into the comments. Uh, so enjoy. Over to you, Charlie and Terrence. Okay. Char uh, Charlie, I, lo I lost Charlie for a second, so I'll just try to try to wing this one. Um, so uh, my name is Terrence Sullivan. Uh, I've, I've worked at uh, Sierra Nevada. I'm actually a graduate from UC Davis. Um, so I, I, I went through the same program that Charlie actually um, taught uh, for a while. Uh, he was not my instructor. Um, he came in uh, a little bit after that. And uh, so anyways, I, I started working at uh, Sierra Nevada uh, 26 years ago. So I've been, I, I was introducing myself a little bit, Charlie, while you were. Uh, yeah, you know, I, 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 I like to put you on edge, Terrence. Yeah. So, um, uh, I, I, I pushed the wrong button right there, you know. Char so. Charlie, it's going to be 109 degrees in Chico today. I don't need anything more to make me sweat, you know. Uh, so, so Charlie, uh, maybe maybe you can introduce yourself a little bit. Of, uh, I was right. telling him I went to UC Davis and uh, uh, studied fermentation science, so. Yeah, before my time, but because, uh, you know, I, I, I arrived at UC Davis in uh, 1999, uh, having been in the brewing industry in the UK, uh, 1978. Um, so I, in the UK, I was with a research organization and with the Bass Brewing Company. So I spent a long time with Bass and um, came to UC Davis to teach the brewing program in 1999. I retired at the end of uh, 2018. And of course, became senior quality advisor to uh, Sierra Nevada, uh, which I'm very proud to be. And uh, written written some books, uh, the most recent one of which, of course, is in praise of beer. And and not just uh, beer books either, right? Now, nah, written uh, written a book about uh, the, the goalkeepers of Wolverhampton Wanderers Football Club, and um, I'm right now I'm uh, ghostwriting uh, the uh, the autobiography of a legendary soccer player called Alan Hinton. So, uh, and I, did, I write a lot of I write a lot of articles in, in programs and magazines and on soccer. How, how appropriate, uh, football and beer, right? Yeah, use the right word, uh, football, yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, they go hand in hand, you know. What, yeah. You know, what, what, is, what is football without a pint of beer in your hand as long as you're not playing? And beer, what does it take to make that beer, right? Um, oh, uh, it's, it's I mean, a process that's been around for for eight thousand years in uh, in uh, one shape or another. And you know, people say to me, uh, you know, is it, how how different is it nowadays? And I say that if you if you sort of got transported back to a time machine about three hundred four hundred years um, to a brewery, say in in England, uh, you'd recognise it. You know, the the fundamental process. Has not changed for a very long time, but, but we, we we just understand the science and the technology much more, so we can do it in a much more controlled way. And we understand what's going on, and we can we can play tunes and and create new styles and understand exactly how to do things and how to troubleshoot and so on. But the fundamental process is is very traditional. Yeah, a little, a little more. Uh, I would say you know. Uh, efficient nowadays right oh, you get, yeah, you get a little, yeah. little bit more out of your grain i mean so so th there might be some people that that don't really uh know how beer is made and, and it's it's a it's a process of uh uh taking barley um and having that uh germinated so part in charlie you can speak to that um you know what what happens during that process yeah i mean barley we're talking about the grain from the, the barley Barley plant brings its seed, but we refer to it as grain. So, uh, 
Uh, it, and it's kind of hard and tough, so it's got to be it's got to be sprouted, malted. It's the malting process where you take that barley and you you steep it in water, and that kicks it into light. Then you allow it to germinate for a few days, and in that time, it becomes softer. And you produce the enzymes. Um, I'm a biochemist, you know. Some people think I use naughty words like enzymes, but you know, enzymes are the heart of beer. Uh, so those enzymes start to soften the grain, and then you dry it. And depending on how you dry it, kiln it, you produce different colors and different flavors. And so you get a range of malts, from the very pale malts, Pilsner malt, right, the, 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 the darker malt, uh, specialty malt. And, uh, and then it goes off to the brewery, and, and you, you know, you're in the brewery right there, the most, uh, the, one of the two most beautiful breweries in the world. The other ones in the river. Um, you can pick up the story in the brewery. Yeah, the the uh, you know the that the, I I always refer to kind of the the wort uh, that we're producing is is in the in the malting process is really the body of the beer. Um, that's what gives uh, uh, you know the, that chewiness, that maltiness, that biscuity notes. Uh, you know, it, it, you you were referring to using uh, uh, like dark malts. You start getting like coffee flavors and chocolate notes, and you know you'll find that in your porters and your stouts and uh, things of that nature. And that that's really, um, you know, I, I think I think of brewing. It is it is science, but there is a lot of art to it. Um, that is being a brewer. That's one of the funnest things is is developing a beer and um, and fine-tuning it tweaking it and and really uh for me that the, the enjoyment part is right at the very end right when we get a drink uh the fruits of well art. absolutely right so so you know those malts i mean the art form is in predict informed by science but but the art of brewer is using this palette if you like of, of of malts to actually create uh, different types of uh, different types of uh, flavor and, and characteristics, but of course the malt is providing much more. It's it's providing the enzymes which are going to break down the starch that's in the malt to the fermentable sugars, and th th that's all produced in the brew house. And there you are sitting in that beautiful brew house in Chico, um, and uh, it's also providing sort of the proteins that are going to give the backbone to the foam, and um, you know all this. Good stuff. The flavor, lots of the flavors coming out of the malt, and, and of course, it's going to be it's going to be ground up and extracted in in the mash, and then you can collect that liquid, the wort that you referred to, and, and then it's going to be boiled with hops. I mean, uh, and and if any company, if any if any company in in the world champion hops, then uh, then that's Sierra Nevada, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, the the hops are, um, you know, I, I like to refer to them as like the the spice of the beer, right? Um, yeah. It's going to add bitterness. It's going to add uh, different flavors, aromas. Um, you know, you can uh, we can talk about Cascade hops. Uh, that's what we right. we use a lot of in our pale ale, and that imparts kind of a uh, the piney and um, kind of grapefruit notes that you'll find in in our pale ale, um, and then. You know, you can add more hops and and make an IPA, um, and probably probably the most popular style of beer nowadays. Yeah, it, and, and that IPA. I mean, you mentioned that we get we'll get back to the process in a bit, but you know, the IPA, the India Pale Ale, um, which uh, the original IPAs, of course, came from uh, from England. I mean, there's a lot of romance about the story, but basically, the argument is the storyline is that these were beers designed to survive the sea passage going around the Cape of Good Hope, around to the jewel in the crown, in India. Um, and to survive that passage, they, they, they you know, prevent bacteria growing. They were made quite alcoholic and very bitter because the bitter substances are, are antimicrobial. But you know, the IPAs then, um, there, there have been two things about them, uh, Terence. One was they would have, uh, they would not have been as hoppy, a hopper, hoppy nose aroma as, as the IPAs that we love um, in uh, North America. And not only that, they would have had something growing in them, a uh, yeast that was uh, named in honor of the British, Breton Mice, given a nice uh, 
the, the various characteristics, the polite one is barnyard flavor, but the, the unpolite way of describing it is, uh, is mouse urine and wet horse <laughs> um, so, so people say to me, how do you get an authentic IPA? I say, well, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, I, I would, and I, I would like your kind of opinion on this, but I feel like uh, uh, Americans kind of rewrote the IPA style, right? Um, yeah, very much so, uh, and they did it more than once. Um, so they, they they rewrote the you know, the West Coast IPA style, which of course was very bitter, which was traditional, but also extremely hoppy, putting putting a lot of hops into the finished beer in the brewery to extract all of that aroma. And then of course it was it was invented a second time with the East Coast IPAs, which, uh, you know, sometimes uh, New England IPAs or people call them juice, juicy IPAs or whatever you want to call them, which are these, you know, a, not so bitter, but a huge hop, hop uh, aroma. And of course, cloudy. Um, right. And this whole business of, of, of cloudy is, is exactly opposite to what I was brought up in the brewing industry to believe it you know so you know, Me too. Yeah. when i was with bass you know if i if we if we we put out a cloudy beer i'd have been out of a job you know? but, right, right but 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 it's turned on its on its head turned the other way around and of course some of these beers are are, are doing remarkably well and and they 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 taste them they're fantastic but you know they, i don't like the look of them but you know, they taste great. They sell pretty course, good, too. <laughs> they sell pretty good, too. Well, that's, that gets that's the important thing. People are enjoying them. And, and, and that's the thing, you know, and that's one of the most important things. And I, I stress this in, in the book, In Praise of Beer, that, you know, never, never ask me to, to dictate to you what is a good beer. Because a good beer is the one that you like and that right. you want, uh, that every, any, any individual person wants. And it's up to them what they like. And if they like cloudy beers, then I, I have no right to tell them that they're wrong. So the original cloudy beer was was a Hefeweizen and, you know, a German Hefeweizen. And, and, and that was acceptable. Um, but really no other styles. Uh... Uh, no, 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 not really any other styles were expected to be to be uh, cloudy. I mean, the Hefeweizen is cloudy because, I mean, Hefe means yeast, and, and so there's still uh, yeast there. Even then, you can get a crystal Weizen, which is a filtered Hefeweizen. So, yeah, different 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 things for different people. I mean, in Bass, we were very traditional, and we used to clarify our beers, draft beers, with, with Isinglass finings, you know, the, which are the proteins coming from the swim bladders from fish from the south china seas you know right. we put a lot of effort into into making sure we added exactly the right amount of isinglass that that, uh, that, that, that that find the beer and made it bright every time and it, and it was a disaster if we had beer in the tray that that wasn't bright and so i mean i love i love the flavor of uh, easy beers uh, i really do they're, they've got right. wonderful flavors it's just my personal taste is that i, I like i like a brilliant looking beer but um yeah. each to his you, or her own you, know? you see through right unless yeah. it's out right we call it we call it bright and and of right. course uh, the the opposite is nqb which is not quite bright <laughs> well so uh you know talking a little bit about half of license right um Yeast plays a, a huge part in in the final beer, uh, in the style of beer, right? Um, well, I mean, fundamentally, yeast. Of course, you know, we we, we we pick up the process again. You you cook, you you boil that wort with the hops, then you cool it down, and you add the yeast, which converts the sugars into alcohol. And of course, the two fundamental types of beer are ales and lagers. Um, you know, I people say to me, "What's the difference between a?" A beer and a lager. Well, beer is the umbrella term, and underneath it, you've got uh, ales and lagers. And, and fundamentally, they're two different yeasts. Uh, ale yeast is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and lager yeast is Saccharomyces pastorianus. And Saccharomyces pastorianus is a very unusual organism. It actually it arose by an ale yeast merging, literally, two cells, uh, an ale yeast cell and a wine yeast cell called Saccharomyces pastorianus. They sort of 
melded together, you know, I know, so we dim the lights one day and, and played some soft music, and they merged together to make this, this super yeast called, which is now referred to as Saccharomyces pastorianus, and that's lager yeast. So the fundamental difference between an ale and a lager is which yeast is an ale yeast or a lager yeast. But you mentioned the Hefeweizen yeast, that's an ale yeast. And it's it's an unusual one in that it, it also has an extra um, gene and an extra enzyme which which is responsible for making that clovey, um, clovey flavor. Right. Um, that is one of the, the two flavors you look for in a Hefeweizen, the, the clove and the banana some people call it bubble gum uh, that's uh, is a sort of called nesta and those two things are um, are critical of course you know the third requirement for advice as well don't you Darren? uh yes no slice of lemon no lemon. slice of lemon at all it, it but, but that goes back to what you were saying too is like um you know nowadays uh beers are so different than when I first started in the industry, which was just 26 years ago. Like I'm, I'm, I still consider myself a pup in this industry. Um, but when, when I first started working at Sierra Nevada, I, I remember uh, Ken Grossman saying, uh, we'd never put fruit in beer. We'll never make a beer with fruit. And uh, look at, look at what we're doing now. And, and, you know, the same thing, like we wouldn't make a hazy beer um unless it was a hefeweizen which was actually his his favorite style when he went to go right. buy our, our uh our breweries in germany uh he fell in love with that style beer um and it, it like like for me on a hot day humid day cold hefeweizen is i i think it's it's wonderful oh it is and i i love it you know and even then though there, there are some people who really don't like the hefeweizen flavor because they don't like the the clothes Oh, and it reminds them of oil of clothes that used to have dripped onto their painful teeth when they were children, you know. Um, <laughs> but 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 a half of ice, and of course it's it's a breakfast beer, really. Uh, you right. know, uh, you go to Bavaria, you're going to have um, half of ice and with white sausage and pretzels, and it's uh, it's going to be just wonderful. Um, but, Re but, refreshing, low alcohol, again? refreshing, low alcohol. Yeah, I mean the most the, the most effervescent beers that uh, that you'll find. Uh, they've got more carbon dioxide in them than any other beer style, and um, but you know not not very high in alcohol. And of course, it's interesting that if you go to Europe, although there are some pretty alcoholic beers there, that you'll find a lot, particularly in in the United Kingdom, you'll find a lot of beers that are are, are certainly not as alcoholic as you're going to find them in the United States. And, and the reason for that in the UK is is taxation. They, they tax the beer in proportion to alcohol strength. So every 0.1% increase in alcohol by volume uh, means more taxation. So that tends to push the, what we call the ABV values down. Right. And then a consumer's got to pay more, right, for a higher alcohol beer, right? Yeah, yeah, a lot more, a lot more uh, expensive. They, of course, in the UK, um, our friends mm -hmm. at, Brewdog, for example, make make make, make a, uh, there's one beer they've got which is 55 percent alcohol, but you know, I, I gather, I gather you can buy it on eBay. What is that tactical penguin? Is that the? No, no, no. That's one called the End of History. That's the one that okay. insert, inserted into stuffed animals, and I, I think on I think on eBay you can you, you, you fork out a four figure stub, and I'm talking pounds now, uh, buy one of those. Uh, yeah. So Kind kind of expensive, but you know it's it's a gimmick. It's a right. gimmick, and 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 we we talk about how you know people are now prepared to 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 make beers that they wouldn't have brewed 20, 30 years ago. Um, I still am not a fan personally. I'm not a fan of ridiculous gimmicks, you know, right. uh, uh, stupidity. Right. Uh, there there are some you know there are some things that belong on a on a dinner plate that should never find their way into a beer glass. You know? Right. But, Let's not name <laughs> Well, um, you know, like one of the things that we're we're doing a lot of now is is barrel age beers, um, and and that was you know people in the old days stored beer in barrels, and that's how it was transferred. But like using spirits barrels, where you're actually extracting some of those flavors out, we found really fun and using different types of spirits, uh, you know, rum rum barrels or 
uh, you know, used bourbon barrels, tequila barrels, uh, really, really fun to kind of experiment with those flavors. And, and that gives you a little extra bump in ABV too, as well in the, in the beer. It does. And, and, and I think, I mean, in terms of art, I mean, art is coming in here because you're not absolutely sure about what is, what is going to happen. I mean, you're, you're pretty confident if you put the beer in a bourbon barrel, you're going to get some bourbon flavors, a bit of extra alcohol. But some of the other flavor changes are going to take place, not always entirely predictable. Um, and uh, and so it's fun, isn't it? And you, I mean, you, have, you and I have been through the the barrels at uh, up in Chico and have sampled some of the, the, the barrels and uh, and pulled out the Vinny nail uh, to take a sample right. and so on. And, and sometimes it's a surprise and, and sometimes not. And of course, the other thing that we've done and, and enjoyed is, is vertical tastings of, of Bigfoot right yeah in, in you know we can we can touch on that you know I know uh, a lot of people uh, check the labels for freshness date codes and things like that you know especially with like IPAs and you know IPAs are a little bit uh, more susceptible to age and and but when you start getting beers that have uh, big malt characters and uh, big, big flavors, big ABVs, um, that, that aging process actually kind of mellows the beer out. And what I like to say, it right. kind of melts the flavors together. Yeah, it, it does. You know, the, the golden rule for, for most beers, um, uh, is, is drink them young, um, because they, they, they do, um, stale. And the, the, the two big enemies of beer are uh, oxygen and heat. And that's why brewer goes out of the way to keep the beer, uh, package the beer with little oxygen as possible. And, that, and this is why a can is more stable, beer in a can is more stable than beer in a bottle, because air can creep between the neck and bottle and cork, but it can't get into the can. But the other thing, of course, is, is, is temperature. Keeping the beer, you know, shipping the beer cold, which you guys do, and then storing it cold, um, in the, in the, in the shop, uh, in, in the home, um, because that buys a lot of shelf. But, but as you say, a, a beer like a Bigfoot, a barley wine, 10% ABV, alcohol by volume, that will age in interesting ways. And just like people would, would age a wine, so you could age a barley wine. And, and Charlie, um, I, I think everyone needs to know you're the Pope of Foam. Um, and, and when we get our beer home, what's the, how should we drink it? How should we drink that beer? <laughs> Put it in a glass. But uh, again, you know, I, 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 hear myself, I hear myself hoisted by my own petard because I say, well, you should drink the beer you like. And I, I have no right to tell you, you, sh you should put it in a glass, but I, I just, wish you would um, you get much more appreciation of the flavor if you if you pour it into a glass because you can smell it much more easily and most of the flavor comes to the nose but also the beautiful appearance of foam um, on the beer and and you know the, not only that you know um, the clarity of the product the color and all of those things why deny yourself the beauty of seeing that so so yeah, I've I've been working on the bubbles of beer since 1928. How sad is that? And how to, to get a nice stable foam. Of course, it's all to do with the proteins that come from the grain and the bitterness that comes from the hops. And these two are the main things that stabilize the bubbles. But uh, you know, I, as I say, I've been around a long time, and I, I spent some while as a uh, quality assurance manager, and I can tell you that. The issue with foam is much more to do with what happens when the beer is poured out. Um, so you've got to pour with vigor. That's what I'm well known for saying, pour with vigor, to actually release the bubbles and produce the bubble. But you've got to have a clean glass. You know, you've really got to have a clean glass. You've got to wash your glass very carefully. And I, I talk about that in the book as well. You know, you be best to wash your, your glasses in the sink at home. You, you know where that is. Um, with hot water and uh, detergent and, and wash the glasses on their own. Don't put any plates in there. Wash the glasses first and then rinse away the detergent and let them drain dry. 
and then you'll have a really clean glass that will give you a, a, a great comb. Yeah. And you, were, you and I, Terence, are clean shaven. There's no mustache. That's well, I, I, I have some stubble there. Um, but, you know, one of the things I, um, I've i always enjoyed, uh, and I always remember uh, one of the first times that I, I met you and we spoke about beer and the pleasure of drinking beer. Um, and, and I remember you, you, like, talked about the romance of when you're getting served a bottle of beer at a, at a restaurant or an establishment and the, it's a lot like the wine process right pouring that beer you know the server pouring a little bit of the beer but giving you the bottle to inspect right and look at right i mean i say to people if, you, if you're pouring out a beer you should always turn the label away from you so that whoever is looking can actually admire your choice you know and the, yeah you know i mean that nice clean glass tilt glass pour, 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 pour just pour with the vigor don't worry about how much, as long as it's not shooting over the top. And then set it down. You can see, and the, the, the foam will start to, to collapse a little bit, but it will solidify and stabilize, and then you can top it up. And it's it's a thing. And if it's a big bottle, then share, you know, share it between people. You know, it, it can be a nice, convivial party experience. And that's what I say to people. If you want to try it from beers, and you, you're out with a, a group, perhaps three or four of you around the table, then, then try different beers and, and share them out and, and get them small glasses. But, you know, the, the, I, I, you know, I tease people. I say, you know, what you got with wine? You got red, white, red. <laughs> occasionally, <laughs> occasionally a few bubbles. But I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm teasing. But, but in truth, you know, in truth, you've got far more beers to select, uh, to far greater portfolio um, when it comes to beers. And for the fundamental reason that, um, whereas the, for the wine, it's very much about the grape. Um, with beer, of course, we, we, we play tunes with malt. Um, we play tunes with the water, hops, and we worry about the yeast much more. Right. Plus other things as well. So there's, the, and there's so much more going on. Right. And, and uh, you know, one of, one of the things I think doesn't get talked about a lot with beer is how well it pairs with food. Hmm. And, you know, in your book, you uh, you have that example of at Sierra Nevada when we had that, uh, what, what was it? Uh, uh, I can't remember the wine. Uh, was no, it we, the did a, we did a dinner. So there were several courses and each one was paired with a wine and a beer. And Ken Grossman said, Bamforth, behave yourself. You know, so I, I thought I was behaving myself. <laughs> And, and the first couple of courses, it was pretty clear that the beer was um, winning right. um, each time. And then the wine guy raced the microphone before the third course, and he, he started unloading on why this was the perfect wine for, for this next course, because the next course uh, course was um, was pork. Um, and he went on and on and on and on and on about why this was the best thing. And... Um, and um, Ken looked at me, he said, you or me? I said, I'll do it. And, and I went to the microphone and I said, look at the menu. Um, the next course is not the pork, it's the next course is the duck. <laughs> <laughs> and then they waved the white handkerchief and said, we give up. Don't give the <laughs> I mean, I love my wine. It's one of the world of wine. But I wish more people would give beer a chance um, yeah. preparing food because I would argue that it's great cheese. I mean, the bread and cheeses that can be paired with Yeah, and, and I would encourage anyone next time that you have uh, any kind of curry, uh, especially like a green curry, um, open up a pale ale. Uh, to, to me, our Sierra Nevada pale ale is fabulous. I, I and, and by the way, I have a great uh, green curry recipe I got to make for you, Charlie. Well, that would be great. Yeah. But, there, you know, there again, Terence, that's an interesting observation. And I mentioned this book. I, I actually mentioned one of my favorite Indian restaurants, which is which is close to Hounslow in uh, West, West London. And, um, and of course, I was brought up always to have um, um, a lager with, with, my, um, with my, my curries, um, Indian curries. Um, and, uh, and there are many great sort of, I, I guess they were more, they were more Pilsner style, some of them more Hellas, 
um, with with my career, and that's what I that's what I would go through. So uh, for so different people for the same sort of style of food would opt for different types of uh, beer. And again, it comes to personal personal choice, personal preference. And, you know, it's exciting. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, and it's doing you good as well. Yeah, and, and, and like uh, you, you think about uh, like desserts, like what, what's better with like a, a, a chocolate cake than oh. barrel-aged narwhal or something, oh. you know, nice barrel-aged beer. Just I, 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 I was doing a, a beer dinner in Davis, California a few years ago, and we, 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 we there were four courses, and we came to the fourth course, and, of course, and it was a chocolate dessert with barrel-aged narwhal. And I started talking about it, and somebody said, "Shut up! Let's just <laughs> let's just enjoy." Right. right. And yeah. and it was you know the, the people were moist around the eye. They were they were, it was just sublime, absolutely uh, sublime. And and you know if you're eating uh, cheese, if you're having a really rich cheese, then some of these sour beers. I'm not a fan of sour beers personally, on certainly on their own. But if you're if you're consuming them with um, um, some of the, 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 the bigger cheeses. Um, wow, wow, what a, what a pairing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, next weekend is the 4th of July. What do you, what are you having with your hot dogs and your hamburger, Charlie? I'm not, I'm not having hot dogs, I'm English. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, I, I, I mean, say what I've just said, you know, at home, I'm not sort of spending all my time, uh, deliberating on you know I, I go for the food i like and i go for the beer i like you know yeah. and there's a there's a very strong likelihood uh, that i'll be having talk nice nice i'll probably be drinking our uh, our pilsner our ah. super fest appropriate yeah. for a hot summer day of course well you know uh, what's hot, appropriate for a hot summer's day is what you enjoy i mean all <laughs> Pretty much all beers are going to be quite refreshing, some some more than others. But, uh, and certainly the, some of these lighter beers are, are great if you're really doing some strenuous activity. God. But uh, but I got I got somebody who cuts my grass for me and I drift to drink the beer. <laughs> nice. I, well, yeah. my, my son is now old enough to cut the grass, so I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. Oh, fortunate good. for that. Yeah. 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 So. Always nice. And, Hi. Hi. Hey guys, I'm just gonna Hi. step in here and, and we'll get to some audience questions. Cool. Okay. Um, so I, I actually am gonna start with uh, my own question and, and Charlie, you kind of uh, you set me up here. Uh, so I, my big love of beers right now is are sours, um, but I don't actually know that much about them. Um, you know, they they always feel to me as something that it has a lot of flavor and they're, uh, you know, they're bold, but they don't have that same, um, you know, bitingness that the IPAs have. Uh, do you, you know, can you guys just give me a little bit of background and figure out, I'll ask the yeah. two experts, you know, give me give some background on some sours. So the next time well, I'm drinking one, I can sound smart. <laughs> yeah, when, when, when I talk about sours, I always start in Belgium with the, the Lambic uh, style beers. So these are breweries in Belgium, Lambic in the, the Flemish, Lambic in the, the French, that basically are spontaneously fermented products. They, they, they encourage uh, different microorganisms to actually um, grow during the, the brewing process. So not only have you got yeast, uh, you've got a bunch of other types of yeast, but you've also got a lot of different types of bacteria. And uh, they're making a lot of um, flavors and a lot of as acid, sourness, lactic acid, basically. So these things are making a lot of funkiness. So you got all these complex flavors. You've got Brettanomyces in there as well. I did a study with with a student once, and we looked at all the different organisms that develop over time. And there's hundreds and hundreds of different microorganisms that are involved in this. And the, the, in in these styles of beer, you don't you, you you have old hops. They use aged hops as well. So the hops sort of break down and go all cheesy, just to add to the funk. Uh, <laughs> And then they're aged, and if they're aged in bottles, an old and a young one, they're aged and they're called the gurza. And, and some people put some fruit in there, cherries, creek, or grandpas, raspberries, and, and so on. And, um, and 
they're fascinating, and there's there's some great ones produced in uh, in the United States as well. Um, so uh, to me, a sour beer on its own um, is is not to my personal palate, but lots of people, and you sound like you're one of them, just adore them. Um, I don't know where you sit on this, Terence. I I uh, I enjoy them. Um, I'm I can't drink them all the time. Um, it's just it's not a style that I drink a lot of. Um, but we we actually started a sour program uh, here, and and one of the things that we do, like we have uh, what we kind of call mother culture, and uh, it's literally where we drove um, uh, some tanks of wort out into a uh, peach field. Um, it's just south of where the brewery is. Uh, it's the uh, Chico State University Farm. Um, and we opened up the top of the, the tanks uh, and put little fans around them. And uh, we let the, the flora that's, uh, that's in, naturally in the air uh, whenever those peach, uh, peach trees are flowering out. Um, so there is a lot of uh, people that will uh, brew when the weather is just right and temperatures are just right. Um, I, I know in Belgium, there's, there's brewers that literally will not brew unless, uh, the weatherman tells them this is the time to brew. Um, and so the risk, the, the, the risk, I mean, you, you mentioned that you did it w way away from the brewery in Chico. I mean, the risk is, is trying to do this style of beer in a brewery where you're trying to make non, um, uh, sour yeah. beers as well. And there are some people who do it very successfully wonderful brewer, of course, in California, um, called Vinny Chiles of Russian River, who, who makes his Pliny, Pliny the Elder and Pliny the Younger, no pronunciation. Um, but he also makes his, uh, his, what he calls his funky beers as well. And, and it, it demands tremendous skill and very careful approaches to keeping the, the different process streams separate. Yeah. Um, very skilled, very skilled thing to do. Yeah, you start getting uh, cross contamination of uh, Britannomyces uh, around your brewery, and uh, that's not a good thing. No, you don't want that. No, I don't want that. no. that's that's that. Uh, uh, oh yes. Hor horse blanket characteristics. It'll. Yeah, barnyard. <laughs> oh, yeah, that does not sound nice. Yeah. Um, so somebody asked that uh, IPAs are having their heyday right now, and you guys talked a little bit about IPAs, but uh, do you think there's a, a type or a style that people will start to get into uh, over here in the next couple of years? What's on the horizon? Uh, so I, I, I will say, I, and this is a style that's been around forever. Um, uh, I kind of, I, I love a great, light lager i love a pilsner just a perfect pilsner to me and i kind of i'm i'm hoping that one and i've been saying it for uh 20 of my 26 years here at sierra nevada that well one of these days the craft beer drinker is going to say i really want a really nice pilsner it's just a it's a style that is it, well, it's, it's still the number one selling beer in the world worldwide um but uh i i just and they're really hard to make. Uh, it, it seems like they're, you know, a simple beer, um, but they are very difficult. And, and Charlie could say why they are. Well, they're, they're, they've got a characteristic in them, which is called late hop character. Or the authentic Pilsner should have a, a so-called late hop character. If you put all the hops into the boiling stage to extract the bitterness, you, you boil off all the aroma. Um, so there's two ways of adding hop aroma. The way for an IPA, for example, is to add the hops to the finished beer, a lot of hops to extract all that aroma. But if you're making a pilsner, uh, you, you hold some of the hops back to the end of the boiling stage. So you add some of the hops back right at the end of the boil. So you keep some of this aroma. And then when you cool and you ferment, the yeast transforms some of that hop material and chemically modifies it to produce a very subtle thing called late hop character. And that's very, very difficult to, to do. And produce it, do it reproducibly. Yeah, um, consistently. It's very hard. It's very hard. I mean, the, the, there's a simple guideline that the, you know the, the the gentler the flavor of the beer, actually, um, the harder it is in many ways. Uh, I, I I used to when I was a professor at UC Davis, we have a beer competition every year. The students would 
could form into groups and they would brew beer. They have to design a beer, brew it, and, and then present it. And nobody ever tried to make a North American style pale black beer because they knew that if they made any mistakes or if it got any age card, it'd be obvious. So they would make sort of Irish stout meats, triple IPA, meats, sour beer, meats, Hefeweizen. And then, you know, you cover, cover every possible mistake. Well, look um, at when, when Ken opened up Sierra Nevada, his first five or six batches of beer were all stouts so that um, he could dial in the brew house and uh, the stout would kind of uh, hide a little bit of imperfections. in there. It, it would, but having said that, I, I forget exactly how many um, of he brewed before he would actually say it's okay. Was it six yeah, or eight? Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was. It was like eight eight brews before he. And then he said, out. "It's okay. I'll I'm, I'll I'll sell this because I, I I I'm pr I'm proud of it." Uh, and I, and that's that's how it should be. It's really attention to quality. Right. Yeah. So you guys mentioned stouts and stuff. We have a question here. Um, when did coffee flavored uh, beers become popular? Um, that, you know, there seems to be a proliferation now of like every single, you know, stout or, or nitro porter or any of those are, are coffee flavored. Um, was that sort of always a, a trend or is that sort of a new, you know, up and coming thing? It's a relatively new thing. Um, the, there's been a stout I know of in um, in California called Bison. It's one of the organic ones that's been around for quite a while with, with cocoa nibs and so on. So, um, you know, there's, there's been a lot of innovation. There's probably more innovation in, in beer styles in the United States than anywhere else in the world. Um, and lots of other people are following on. Um, you know, coffee, you know, coffee and stout, you know, the... They're, they're bedfellows, really. And you mentioned nitrogen. I mean, nitrogen has been used in, in uh, serving Guinness for, for many years. Uh, the main reason is to give much more stable foam. But it, it, uh, nitrogen tempers the, the harsh character. It, 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 it sort of tones down that roasted character. That's why you can go to a coffee shop and get cold poured coffee uh, under nitrogen. Uh, and so, you know, nitrogen, coffee, beer, a stout, you know, they're, they're sort of, you know, the, the thought process is obvious, you know, that they go hand in hand. Yeah, we, uh, we've we played with coffee for quite a few years and, and we use it in our barrel program. Um, we had a coffee stout, but what we found was, was probably the nicest was uh, using cold brewed coffee in our beer because it, it really tones down that, that heart harshness when you actually uh, you know, boil, boil the coffee in there. And, and so we actually make a separate batch that's cold brew. And then we, uh, uh, we put that into our beer. You know, and the other, the other thing related to this, of course, is chocolate. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, one of the, one of the malts is called chocolate malt, which is a little bit less harsh than say a, a black malt or a roasted barley. But um, so some people, when they talk about chocolate beers, they're talking about chocolate malt, but there's at least one beer I know from, from, originally from London, that literally has got a bar of chocolate in it, a bar of Cadbury's chocolate, um, and, and probably I believe a lot of chocolate essence. So literally, if you're drinking it, you feel like is that young? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, I went to that brewery, uh, yeah. the, the original one that is now closed, I think. It is, uh, and that was maybe one of the best beers I've ever had. <laughs> There was well, they were very proud of, of, proud of it. But yet, you know, John John Young used to he used to donate beer to uh, Queen Mother, so the Queen's mother used to drink Young's beer as well. So, by appointment to Her Majesty the Queen. Um. Uh, now I definitely want uh, a beer and some chocolate. So um, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, another question that we have here are, what do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions about beer? What do you think people don't quite understand about beer? Uh, well, I know, I know big... where Charlie's going to go. Well, Potato big... chips and uh, sitting around and uh, on a couch, right? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, pe people, they, the misconception is that beer is somehow um, less healthy than wine. Um, and the, 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 the reality is it's, it's quite the opposite. Beer has actually got some valuable nutrition in it, including yeah, uh, it's got fiber, yeah. It's got uh, prebiotics. It's got silica. 
um, which accounts as osteoporosis, one of the richest sources of silica in the diet is beer. Um, and, um, and so there is, there's actually more nutritional value in beer than there is in wine. Uh, but, uh, but people talk about the beer belly, you know, and they say, oh, beer belly, it's full of calories. So, well, not if you have it as part of a, a well-balanced lifestyle, calories in, calories out. And the main source of calories um, is the alcohol. And it doesn't matter whether it's alcohol from beer or alcohol from wine. So. Uh, and, and the issue is, you know, as, as, as I think I point out in the book, it really is about lifestyle. You know, I, I jokingly say that, that people who drink wine um, eat lettuce leaves and jog. Uh, people who drink beer um, eat burgers and fries and watch ball games. And um, <laughs> um, There's a little truth to that. Well, it, it, so it is a lifestyle thing, you know. Um, but um, the, the simple reality is that it, it, beer can, can very much be part of a, um, a wholesome lifestyle. It's, it's just that you've got to balance it with all the other good things and, and do everything in, in moderation, you know. And, and it's, uh, so it's a terrible misconception that somehow, um, and, and of course, this business of, um, you know, moderate alcohol consumption, cutting down the risk of coronary heart disease, well, you know, beer is just as effective as a source of alcohol as, as wine in that respect as well. So, uh, but help, when you talk about alcohol and health, it's, it's always a very difficult um, a place to walk um, yeah. and you've got to do it responsibly yeah. and you've got to drink responsibly. You know, I've, I've lost 20 pounds and I still drink beer. I've lost 32 pounds. I moved to, to small plates, right? So <laughs> don't eat as much. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's right. And, um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's about that exercise and, and fitness and, and, and so on. As we said earlier on, uh, you know, I, I have another life in the world of football. And, and, uh, throughout my uh, lifetime, lots of uh, football players, soccer players have drunk a lot of beer and uh, some uh, fit, fit guys, you know. Uh, and I have I have one. Is, uh, yeah, I wouldn't argue with that. Beer, beer, beer in cans uh, uh, is not metallic. You can't taste the metal. Yeah. <laughs> so just, just get that one out there. Yeah, yeah. People say oh, it's metallic. No, it isn't because the the can is lime. No, it's yeah. lime. You ain't gonna pick up any. Uh, I mean, but even me, you know, I've got this psychological thing about beer in, in a can in a restaurant. I don't, I don't like to see a can in a restaurant, which is it's bizarre. It's bizarre. Um, but you, you, you do something I don't do, uh, uh, Derek. You go fishing, and I bet you, you've got lots of cans in there. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to weigh down the boat too much. <laughs> It's just, it's a small kayak, you know, so I don't have a lot of room either. So, um, how about the seasonality of beer? So uh, a lot of uh, breweries, you know, a lot of companies will put out their fall beer, their winter beer, their summer. You know, they they kind of um, is that just a marketing thing, or is there is there a seasonality to the styles of beers, um, you know, and, and or is it just like length of time for brewing process? I mean, what what is a, a you know, winter lager versus a normal lager? <laughs> Hardy. Um, we, we do uh, we do seasonal beers, um, you know, and, and I, you know, honestly, like our celebration, mm -hmm. ale, it's it's my favorite beer. Um, it is actually designed. It's a it's a West Coast IPA, uh, maybe a little bit more malty than uh, what a, a today's West Coast IPA, um, but it's made with the fresh hops from that year's harvest. So it always comes out a little bit later. So it doesn't have as, as long of a selling window for us. Um, it comes out in mid the middle of October uh, because we're actually waiting for that year's fresh harvest of hops to come in and, and we use 100% um, that year's harvest. So it's, um, but it's a, it's a beer that I really look forward to. It's, it's so good on, you know, the fall nights and as you're getting into uh, the holidays and Christmas time, uh, it's just, it's, full flavored. Um, you know, I look at our summer fest. Uh, I love it, you know, cold out of an ice chest camping, um, or, or whatever out of the fridge, um, or watching my son mow the lawn as Charlie said earlier. So, I mean, there's a history of, uh, same in, in, uh, the native, my native land of, of England, you know, uh, winter time, um, beer is on 
basically mold over spices and, 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 and the like. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, you know, uh, you can mention another company, the Anchor Brewing Company, every year come out with their, their winter, their, their seasonal beer. They call it Christmas beer, do they? I can't yeah, remember. Yeah. But, uh, and every year, uh, closely guarded secret in terms of which herbs and spices and so on that you're using for that. Yeah. And of course, in Germany, the Bock beers, there's the, 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 the Mike Bock, Winter Bock. Um, the Winter Bock is, is, is bigger, and older, and Darker um, and um, fuller, um, but the sort of the older conditions. And, uh, and like saisons, right? Saisons were uh, designed, uh, brewed in the winter time as a as a summer beer, right? Yeah, and the saisons is a fascinating um, style in that it's it really is ill determined exactly what it is. Uh, I mean, the saisonniers they were sort of roaming farm workers and they would turn up at farms and, and, and whatever was on that farm they would use to brew to brew beer you know and, and it will be variable it depends on, on where it was and what the crops were and so on so there's no there's no hard and fast rule about exactly what a saison should be right mm. Also a favorite of mine. Those are always weird and delicious somehow. Um, so we have time for just one last question. Um, so, and I figured I would just let you guys kind of give me some some favorites. Uh, so beyond Sierra Nevada, um, what are some other, uh, you know, go-to uh, favorites, you know, styles or, or brands or whatever it is. Uh, but yeah, what, what are some tops? You're going to put you the Okay. I mean, you guys have been, you have been mentioning a few throughout, um, you know, so I just figured I would give you a, a minute here to give me the, the tops. <laughs> okay. Um, Saison Dupont, uh, one of my, one of my favorites, uh, Orval, um, uh, that's, that's going to have that little bit of Britannomyces in it. Uh, so that's going to get you your barnyard. Um, and I, you know, honestly, um, a lot of you know local brewery we have a, another little brewery here in town secret trail uh and he makes one of the best dortmunders uh i've ever had it's a lovely beer um you know for me um i i try you know i have to uh it's kind of you know competitors beers and things like that and uh um there are so many just great beers out there um but definitely Saison Dupont and Orval. Um, uh, I've been known to to, to have a uh, Miller Light every once in a while and a Budweiser. So I, uh, I I would I mean there's two two countries that I really enjoy drinking my beer in other than uh, my enjoying in the states as well of course but my native England and I what I what I like is my uh, cask conditioned ale traditional cask conditioned ale which is the beer that basically is, is straight from the fermenter and then uh, clarified with the findings and uh, low carbonation. And I would name uh, the beer would be a uh, pint of black sheep, massive, great. And the other place that I absolutely adore is Belgium. And there's nothing quite like uh, sitting uh, in a cafe in uh, Ghent Drinking a, a West Mall. It's a great glass, place. of course, with exactly the right label on the glass and um, letting the world go by. Uh, and hopefully, we'll be able to do that again pretty soon. And, and Charlie, so that that is uh, that's an important thing that you don't see in the United States is the proper glass for the proper beer. That's critical. I mean, why why would you let let the beer down at the end by not presenting it properly. So it's not only putting it in clean glass, it's also got to be the correct glass. And people say, what's the correct glass? It's the one that's not got the wrong name on it. <laughs> that, that is the fundamental rule. That, that is. Fundamental that's... rule. Of... Yeah, I, I think that that's a good uh, note to end on there. Find the find the right glass. Um, I find a lot of beers these days are posting like what the glass should be on the side. 
um, which I love, you know, is that like, you know, don't always know what it should be. Um, so the, the little extra help is always nice. Um, so thank you both um, for joining us and chatting with us and answering all of our, uh, you know, questions. Uh, we really appreciate it. And everyone out there, be sure to go check out Charlie's uh, book in praise of beer. There should be a little link down there somewhere for you to check it out. Um, so yeah, thank you guys. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <laughs>